Welcome to the Grace Point Publishing Podcast. Join us on a journey with our authors as they explain the meanings behind their message, discuss what inspires them to write, and share the many parts of their book publishing journey. And now, here's your host, co-founder and publisher of Grace Point Publishing, Michelle Vandepass. This book, The Real Genesis Hidden in Plain Sight, Creation, Extraterrestrials, and the Defense of Adam and Eve. I mean, even the title just makes you want to pick up the book. Thanks for being here today. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to jump right in because this is a fascinating book. It looks like you've done a lot of research and thought on it. One of the things that jumped right out at me was you said the story of Adam and Eve implies we have no second chances in life. Do you believe that to be true? Oh, no, no, I don't. But I'm thinking we were taught in grade school, I went to Catholic grade school, that everything we have problems with in life, whether it's an exam or this didn't work out with somebody or having problems with their parents or parents having problems with the kids, everything, everything was because of Adam and Eve. You know, I'm in first grade, six years old, thinking about this sort of thing. And I was very impressionable and very Catholic and that sort of thing. So I just grew up with that thing. Well, the reason the friendship ended was because Adam and Eve. And then this happened in Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve. And I'm thinking, whoa, (laughs) that can't be right, can it? Really? And it just dawned on me, what's an alternative? And when you're a youngster, you just take everything at face value. And it takes a while for you to develop your own thought processes and that sort of thing. And then it came up, you know what, that can't be right. And then with my attorney lawyer background, You know, I look at a situation different than what a pastor or a theologian would see. I come from a completely different direction. So I look at it again with fresh eyes. There's no way that can be true. That's just a story. It just kind of lets you in the door because the rest of the thing is God is so merciful. God is for this. And even now I hear on the radio pastors talking about how merciful God is, isn't great God and everything else. And I feel like I shout back at him through the radio. Well, what happened about Adam and Eve? God didn't forgive them. At least that's how the story goes. Because it's set up that way in the Bible, and of course, there's many interpretations of it. I'm not a theologian either, but it does present that way that, okay, you screwed up. That's it. Now you got to pay the consequences. So what other way could you interpret that? I think that the story of Adam and Eve is like an allegory. I remember Emmett Fox, I put this in my book. He felt the same way. He says, Adam and Eve represent every man and every woman and the consciousness of each one. Eve represents the volatile nature, the feeling nature. And when you get into problems or you get into issues, that's usually the first one to engage and boom. And then the Adam part is the results of that. So your emotions kick in. Let's say you're slighted by something and you get angry, get back. And the next thing I'm going to take a step, I'm going to get even with that person, and everything else. So I think that was the scripture's way of saying basically what Emmett Fox was saying. It's every man, it's every woman. In your internal nature, this is how it happens. There's also, I think, some forgiveness that happens if you follow the fact that forgiveness and love can heal so much, right? Oh, right. Sure. If you look in the New Testament, our Lord was forgiving everybody, this, that, you know, the thing, the lady who was caught committing adultery and the Jews are ready to stone her And he just writes in the sand and he says, well, the one without sin, you cast the first stone. And one by one, they drop the rocks and walk away. And he says, well, nobody's here to say something against you. I certainly don't. And then he didn't tell her, boy, you're going to be suffering over here really bad. The lady in the well, when he's sitting in there and the Samaritan woman in the water, and she says, I have to get back to my husband. He says, oh, you have five husbands. It brought out her, quote, sins. But our Lord said, just go and sin no more. He didn't tell her, oh, by the way, you're really going to have to suffer. They're going to nail you to the cross. It was never, never that way. And yet that's what it's being preached. So you touched on this at the very beginning where you said, brought up, good Catholic boy. But even as a young age, you were questioning some of what you were being taught. You didn't just buy in 100%. At what point do you think you were just like, I got to go research this? Even as a youngster, somehow I just knew that Our life here is not all there is. I just had an inherent understanding of that. One time in grade school, I remember talking to my mom. Mom, sometimes I feel like I'm not here. 
And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. I just feel like I'm not here. And it bothered me so much. Do you still feel that way? Being not here like you're just really in touch with another dimension, another world? Yeah, and in some ways even more. But I don't feel like I'm going to disappear and fly up to the sky or anything like that. It's just a quiet internal knowing that this is not all there is. We're a spirit in a physical body, that type of thing. And I had probably a more sensitive feeling about that. In the beginning of the book, you talk about how you were compelled to write this. It almost sounds like it just channeled through you or was inspired through you. I know actually writing the book is more complicated, but the knowledge, you talk about how the knowledge came to you. And you're a lawyer, you're a pretty grounded person, you're obviously extremely intelligent. How do you balance that internal knowledge with your logical mind? Yeah, it's kind of like the merger of the opposites <laughs> a little bit. I've always gravitated towards metaphysics, even without knowing what it was. And I was just awe-inspired about the cosmos. I remember as a youngster, my mom would hang clothes in the outside. And I remember looking up at the sky. I remember saying, oh, mom, just look at there. Isn't it just so big? I'm just so fascinated with the cosmos. And I just love reading about Einstein and cosmology. And it's just incredible. And metaphysics, too, is always there. But when I got older, I got grounded. I had that internal within me, but I also had the feeling as an attorney, I can help a lot of people. And then what I find now is that I got a merger of them because you can get spaced out just thinking about cosmology and mathematics and everything else. You got to live in the real world. I remember Einstein was in a situation where his wife was ill or something. They had a maid to help them with everything. And he couldn't even write a check. He was so into his world, he didn't know how to live in the real world for a lot of practical things. And so the assistant in the house was the one that had to do all the stuff. I'll do this, I'll go get it, all that sort of thing. But anyway, the law gave me a certain grounding for sure. When I hear stories or talk to people, just with my background in reading cases or anything else, I feel like internally it just comes to me right away. That can't be right. Or this is not true. Or it's just not happening that way. Somehow you're tapping into a sixth sense of knowing what's true for you. Yes. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And you run with it, which not everybody does. Well, I run with it, but I'll present it on my paper and go through it. And even when I'm just watching TV or listening to radio or music or whatever, in the back of my mind is going through, what about this? What about that? So I'm enjoying the music, but I'm going through the calculations in the back. Well, if that happened and this happened and then this didn't work, then I put that in writing and then see where it takes me. It's like I'm downloading or something is being downloaded to me. It's just too, too awesome. So there's just a small thing that lingers with me and I can put that down. And then I'm allowed to step through and say, oh, well, this is the main point. Okay, now how do I get there? Or how should one get there logically? And that's where the writing comes in. Yeah, absolutely. And you did research this book very well. So one of the things that I find so fascinating is I'm not Catholic and not brought up Catholic, but it seems to me looking in from the outside, like there's a lot of metaphysics in Catholicism. There's a lot of otherworldly signs in Catholicism and lots of other religions and spiritual traditions, right? Absolutely. It's not like you're throwing away your religious background, it's somehow you've integrated different sides of everything. Yes. One of the things in my book that I bring out is that even for people who'd say, ah, oh, there's no such thing as ETs, extraterrestrials, that can't work. Everybody in the world prays about something or wants something or has a loved one that they believed are in the nirvana or heaven or whatever. There's a deep internal belief that there's another world out there, that there's other spirituality and it's out there, and it seems like they're already praying. How many saints are there? Good grief. <laughs> Just an amazing number of saints. And I'm thinking, well, if people believe that to their dying day and all through their life, what's one more thing about ETs in this life? It's just another entity. I remember you can bury a saint in your front yard when you're, I mean, not the real saint, a little image, a little doll to sell your house and those kinds of things, like lots of intention and spiritual practice. So let's get to the ET part. And you even have an image of a flying saucer or an ET or a UFO on the front of the book. So how, how does that 
playing in. I watch Ancient Aliens. We're going to talk about Stephen Greer in a minute. I have an experience with Stephen. Oh, wow. Okay. But just talk to me about how the ET piece plays in here. I basically say that ETs, extraterrestrials, are presaged in the Bible. That is, it's talked about in the Bible. In the Bible book of Genesis, there's two creation accounts. One creation account, it just says very quickly that God created man and that was it. There's no details. And then it goes on to say, and then God created Adam and then Eve and everything else. And it is very specific. It is very specific how he took some dirt and molded it and breathed life into him. And that was Adam. And then he took Adam's rib and made a woman out of that. In other words, it's very, very specific. And I'm thinking, well, that first creation account where it says, let us make man in our image and likeness, that's what it says, that really is not talking about Adam and Eve. And yet a lot of theologians say, no, no, they just mean the same thing. And again, my lawyer background, it is said that the Bible was divinely inspired and all that sort of thing. And I'm saying, well, to me, it seems very clear that the first creation account, let us make man in our image and likeness, is different than the image and likeness about Adam and Eve. They're two different things. So I'm thinking, well, heck, then that first creation account could be other men perhaps ETs, not Adam and Eve, other entities. And the reason the Bible didn't go into that is because people at that time, and even the writers, whether it was Moses or helpers and several perhaps, they had no logical understanding about what that could possibly mean. All they knew was the earth and the sky. They had no concept of the cosmos the way it was at that time. They had no concept of 13 plus more billion years of the cosmos that we know it's at least that old, maybe even older before it came into being, perhaps. So that's where I gather that. And it says that after the first creation account, you would subdue the earth and go on. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that first set of creation accounts could be what we would now call ETs. And the reason they're not here physically is maybe they already subdued the earth and are around going to different worlds, subduing other worlds as well. That's kind of a broad picture of how I see it, because I really don't see the second creation account being a repeat of the first one. There's nowhere else in Genesis does that happen. In your resources page at the back of the book, you have some other books that people can read. So I got to tell you a Stephen Greer story. Back in, uh, I think it was the late 90s, I did a remote viewing class and Stephen Greer came to Colorado. Wow. And we went out into the fields with ET attracting information and laid down up in the high desert mountains of Colorado and laid down runways and so forth so the ETs could land if they ever wanted to. So I'm outing myself a little bit. Wow. <laughs> Anybody who's going to listen, but that's my Stephen Greer story. That's amazing. Wow. Was that an overnight thing? It was the middle of the night, so we were out all night, yeah. Oh, wow. Did you guys see anything? Uh, no, we did not see anything. However, I have personal deep beliefs and faiths that I have seen several things in my life. Unexplainable to my third dimensional world, but totally explainable if I move into the possibility of all things are possible. For me, I don't think we really know. And so it's fascinating to read your book because it explores some other concepts. But I'm not sure you're definitively saying this is how it is. You're just asking lots of questions and asking us to be open to possibility. Precisely. Yeah, because I don't know. What I'm saying is that you don't have to accept this if you don't want. If you're happy with what you've been doing all these years, fine. Stick with it. Forget about what I'm writing here. I'm just saying this is the way that I see it. This is the way that is what comes to me and I'm sharing it with you. But I also say this comes through me, not from me. So take it at whatever level you want. Nobody has the absolute understanding of the infinite. Good grief. How can that be? Are there worlds? Are there multiverses? Are there this? Are there that? Are we in a matrix? Even in Catholic grade school, we were taught, they didn't call it the matrix at that time. But another concept was everything is in the mind of God. Everything that is going on is in the mind of God. And they didn't go on to explain that, but if you take the ideas that are being talked about now about the matrix, it could be like, this is like a divine matrix. I always wonder about parallel universes and living out hundreds of 
reincarnations, but all simultaneously in parallel universes in different time. Because there is no such thing as time, really. It's an earthly construct because of the sun and so forth. Anyhow, going down rabbit holes here again. Well, here's another rabbit hole. We're in grade school, first grade to eighth grade. You know, we go to religion class, we study the Bible, all that sort of thing. And I remember friends talking about, you know what, reincarnation. The Catholic Church knows the reincarnation, but they decided not to tell that to the people because they would lose heart and just become too devastated by the big road ahead of them. So the Catholic Church has stopped it. In other words, the traditional teaching is, this is your life, this is your run and only chance, so do a good job of it. That's one thing. We're back to that. There are no second chances. Yeah. And another thing we were taught about that God creates heaven and then there's a mutiny in heaven. And we could be part of the angels that made the wrong decision. And having to be in this earth and going through all this is God's way of our coming back. Grade school, grade school talk on the playground, no less. Eric von Daniken, he has a very similar background to Mike. The Jesuits taught him, talking about heaven is a perfect place. God is there. That's God's home. When he found out about the rebellion in heaven, he said, how can that be? This doesn't work. And he asked the Jesuit fathers about that. And one of them told me, you know, read the book of Enoch. And then that got him going on his big change in life and what he ended up doing, just doing all the traveling and writing and the speaking that he's done. What are you doing now? Now that the book's out, we're releasing it. What's your next step? Is there another book? Are you researching? I'm already getting ideas on like a sequel to this one. But I also spent a year and a half in Mexico and wrote my thesis in Spanish. And it was about El Escudo Nacional de Mexico. And that means the coat of arms of Mexico. And that's one where it's got a snake in its mouth and it's perched on a cactus. And I wrote my thesis about that. And it was metaphysical. Going back to metaphysics, it was the cactus was the difficulties in life, the thorns, all that sort of thing. The snake was evil. And the eagle, of course, was your uplifted nature. And how the eagle devours the serpent, but it has to be on top of the cactus in a very remote part in the middle of like a swamp area. And I just went on and developed that as well. I've been trying to find the best way to publish that so that's not like a thesis, but develop that. It sounds fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading that one. The book is The Real Genesis, Hidden in Plain Sight, available everywhere books are sold, ebook, paperback, book, maybe an audio book. Who knows? It's been a pleasure. Is there one last thing you'd like to leave our listeners with? It's just been a pleasure to work with you and Grace Point. It's been a very nice experience, and I hope we can get some good results on the book. It's a beautiful cover, and I got a lot of good help, but the cover is just magnificent. Everything just, wow, it just hits the nail on the head. Beautiful book, beautiful author. Thank you for being a guest today, Mel. Thank you, Michelle. Bless you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Grace Point Publishing Authors Podcast. We can't wait to talk more next time as we introduce you to another one of our amazing authors. Make sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss a single episode of the Grace Point Publishing Authors Podcast. To find out more about our authors and to see how we can help you publish your book, head to gracepointpublishing.com. Keep writing. Keep creating. Your words matter.